che riesciamo a aperto. Sì. Ok, so thanks for being here. This is uh, the third Casalegna lecture by Professor Robert Stolker, MIT. Uh, so the title of today's lecture is uh, The Projection Strategy. Please. Hey, thank you. So, um, so far, particularly last time, my arguments, such as they are, have been mainly negative. I, although I tried to articulate a certain uh, approach uh, to a strategy for solving problems about counterfactual conditionals, I argued it was a misconceived strategy. And the main focus of my argument was not that it doesn't succeed on its own terms, but that it um, makes uh, uh, the, the sort of metaphysical assumptions about the nature of the fundamental base to which one reduces counterfactuals were uh, implausible. Uh, today I want to focus mainly on uh, a positive alternative because if you in general reject um, uh, a reductive strategy, it's not, and yet you still say there is something to be explained. Uh, there's some problems uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, one has work to do to explain what those problems are and to say what alternative short of reduction counts as progress on understanding the concepts. But before we get to that, I want to make, I didn't um, uh, get, get uh, time to go into very much detail about Lewis's constructive project, that is what he's doing with the metaphysical assumptions that he's, he's uh, making. I did uh, spell out on the handout a sort of sequence of steps and a crucial uh, uh, requirement um, of his project is that the steps be non-circular, that is one one ex stakes, uh, explains the first of the um, problematic concepts uh, in a way that's, that makes no assumptions about any others. And once one has explained that, then one has it to use to make uh, further uh, steps in explaining other uh, concepts. So I talked a little bit about laws of nature, which on Lewis's view are just completely descriptive uh, generalizations about regularities, patterns of regularity in the distribution of particular facts. Um, they, in the sort of intuitive understanding of explanation, one might say, they don't really provide an explanation um, for anything, for the way the facts are. It's not that we don't explain the uniformities by um, by the laws, that is, the, the patterns exist because of the laws, but rather the laws simply are descriptive of the patterns. Each step, Lewis would agree, of his uh, argument, of his analysis, of the whole family of concepts, has its own problems, and each one is an unfinished project with more work to be done. So it's, it's only presented in a kind of tentative um, way, but I wanted to just make a few remarks about wh why uh, a more uh, critical kind about the project from its own terms in that, in that um, uh, the particular task of explaining the criteria of similarity that govern the uh, interpretation of counterfactual conditionals don't do what he thought they would do. That is, they don't work on their own terms. But to explain at least one feature of counterfactuals which uh, is in need of explanation on anybody's uh, account. So, um, again, it's important for Lewis that these criteria be spelled out in a way that's neutral, uh, which makes no assumptions about causal structure. Although, I mean, it's not circular. Right? Um, so, um, we do have, however, the notion of a law of nature to work with because that's something which explains prior to the... Uh, so, um, Goodman assumed in his analysis 
that um, the laws remain fixed in the counterfactual. I mean, it, they were part of the, uh, the the factual things that could be held fixed and 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 uh, used to derive the consequent of the uh, of the conditional. Lewis, uh, and this is one of the surprising discoveries of his work, um, says, at least on the assumption of determinism, you cannot keep the laws fixed. So his criteria don't say, first priority, keep the laws intact. Because, um, uh, well, we'll see, we'll, we'll talk more later about uh, the problems with uh, conflicts with uh, determinism. But um, Instead, the most important thing is to keep the little facts exactly the same over as large a stretch as possible. So a world in which, which is precisely the same descriptively or over a range of uh, time uh, is a closer world than one that um, diverges, all other things being equal, which diverges uh, more often, or sooner, or later, or whatever. So, hold a um, hold the uh, the particular facts fixed for a long period of time. Uh, second requirement was um, don't violate the laws in any big way. No major or multiple. Uh, miracles. Going to think of a miracle just as a technical term for a violation of the law of nature. A violation of our laws of nature, of course, is not a violation of the laws of nature in the counterfactual world. The counterfactual world will have other laws. Um, but ones, the laws have to be close in a sense. Uh, um, this, uh, of course, again, this is another distinction that needs to be explained, the distinction between major and minor uh, miracles. And, so Lewis's thought was, uh, if you hold, uh, I mean, you, you, you have to, if the antecedent is false, you have to introduce some violation of the law of nature to make it true. But um, we make a little one, keeping the actual course of events up to close to the time, if the antecedent is a sort of about an event, which is the thing he focuses most on. Um, then you want to hold the world uh, absolutely fixed uh, up until a certain time very close to the event when the antecedent takes place, then introduce a little um, blip, a little miracle, which sort of shifts things um, and makes the antecedent true. But and then he suggests in doing so, having held the rest of uh, the world uh, fixed, the little miracle will proliferate and will lead to great, radical, big changes in the subsequent course of events. Um, and that's unavoidable, he suggested. Uh, so either you have to change the facts, the particular facts, all along, or else you have to introduce a very big miracle if you're going to keep things approximately the same uh, later. So one of the things that needs to be explained with counterfactuals is why is it that in a, uh, our ordinary intuitive notion, when you say that something might have, you know, that, uh, and this is Kit Fine's example from a review of Lewis's book, if, if uh, Nixon had pushed the, um, the button uh, starting off a nuclear war, the world would have been very, very different from the way it has developed in the meantime. And everybody knows that, and that doesn't make the counterfactual uh, questionable. So Lewis to say, well, if you, you can hold the future, whereas the past completely fixed, have a small miracle, and that's the closest world. To which one can apply, well, why not hold the future fixed? absolutely the same, and let the past be divergent. And Lewis said, well, that won't work. Not, we don't build it into our theory, 
So the, it was important for Lewis the theory be temporally neutral. We're not going to we're not going to make temporal um, uh, 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 have temporal criteria in our and the reason was he wanted to say it's it's a fact about the world that causation where is has the asymmetries that it has. We want to explain the temporal the temporal asymmetries of causation. We don't just want to stipulate. Some people, in looking at Humean analyses, have said, "Well, um, cause, you know, causes are simply regularities, but the one that comes first is called the cause, and the one that comes later, if there's a regular a constant conjunction, is called the effect." And that's just to stipulate that causation is forward in time. And Lewis wanted to explain it as a de facto regularity, something that derives from the features of um, the natural world. But given the symmetry in the fundamental laws of nature according to a deterministic theory, um, if you're a determinist, um, um, then uh, one could argue that it's, it's, it takes no more of a miracle to um, a convergence miracle rather than a divergence miracle. Um, a miracle which um, uh, introduces a small change in the law of nature which keeps everything the same from now on but leads to radical variations in, in the past. And in fact, um, in response, in criticism of Lewis, Adam Elga has, has a paper arguing that given thermodynamics, um, um, the, uh, the change in the world to create convergence so that the, the little, the, the, lo the microstates of the world uh, are exactly the same from now on uh, is just as easy, just as same, just a same kind of violation of law as the one that keeps the past the same and changes the future. You can't do both uh, without bigger miracles maybe, but you could do either one symmetrically. So the idea is that it's at least argued that Lewis uh, is sort of implicitly bringing in some sort of causal intuitions into the assumption that there's an asymmetry which is uh, explained by his, uh, his way of, of uh, making these, uh, these distinctions. Now, it's not that I have, on my strategy of how to deal with these problems, a better um, explanation of the, um, the nature of the asymmetries in causal structure. Uh, it's a feature that's there, and it is a problem to explain the relationship between stipulation or, or something that's part of your theory, um, your conceptual structure, which imposes this regularity and the extent to which it's in uh, the facts about, uh, about nature. But at least uh, we'll just look a little more at that, uh, particularly when we get to action where asymmetries uh, are particularly uh, important. Um, okay, so that's just to suggest that it's not so clear that Lewis's strategy works to even solve the problems that he himself was most interested in solving. But um, Today, again, I just want to focus more on the, um, on the alternative strategy. But I'm going to start with the example we, uh, we looked at in, I mean, it just came up more in, in discussion, but uh, the famous uh, example of Alan Gibbards uh, of the Mississippi uh, Riverboat. So we talked about this, so I'm not going to go into detail, but on the handout it sort of spells out in detail. And the there's a very artfully designed example to, to try to make it very difficult to explain on a truth conditional propositional account um, how uh, the context could be different uh, in these two uh, cases. And I don't want to sort of re-argue that issue so much as to go on and make some further points about what this example shows. Okay, so basically the form of the example, it's an example where one person is in a position to rule out one uh, possibility, 
um, but leave two others. A second person is in a position to rule out another of the three possibilities, but not the two others. And it's only by pooling the information that, uh, that the person who gets both pieces of information can draw the conclusion that it's the third alternative that's the correct uh, one, the one that, uh, um, uh, that neither of them uh, is in a position to rule out. Um, okay, so Pete either called uh, and won in the poker game, he called and lost in the poker game, or he folded, uh, not seeing the bet. Um, not calling by seeing the bet. Um, and one person sees both hands and so knows um, that uh, uh, Pete has the losing hand and the person who has the losing hand, if he folds, would lose. So he knows uh, that if he did call, he lost. Uh, the other uh, informant knows that Pete is cheating and he knows, so therefore knows both his own hand and his opponent's hand. And given that he's the presupposition that he's rational, he's not going to he's not going to uh, call unless he has a winning hand. And so, therefore, if he calls, he will win. This is the first person does. doesn't know whether he neither one of them knows whether or not Pete um, called. Okay, so that's the form of the example. What does it um, show? I mean, when say, well, both the informant's statements. Uh, conditional statements of the form, if he called, he won, and if he for, called, he lost, seem to be uh, uh, based on correct information. So it seems, uh, if we say that it's not appropriate to assert something unless you have, uh, are in a position to believe that it's true, uh, if, this, if they do have truth values, it looks like both people, uh, uh, if they're justified in saying what they're saying, then they're correct in saying what they're saying. But the, the two conditionals seem to conflict with each other. And that was the puzzle, whereas on a truth assertion view, you can explain uh, why they're both justifiable. Now, whatever one concludes about the viability of a propositional analysis of this, um, of indicative uh, conditionals, the story does bring out, and this is sort of midway through the the handout here, uh, the first page of the handout, when um, um, the following um, fact um, um, about epistemic dispositions uh, seems to uh, be the take home lesson, one take home lesson of this uh, example. So, um, uh, epistemic dispositions, that is, being in a position to infer something from evidence uh, is a fragile relationship. Given what else, it depends a lot on what else you happen to know. So one can construct, and this is only one example, it would be easy to construct many examples of this kind of thing, where the same piece of evidence, given one person's background knowledge, uh, would be, lead one to infer uh, one thing, and the very same piece of evidence would lead a different person with a different background set of beliefs to draw the opposite conclusion. So, um, um, and again, Quine, Shaw, or, you know, and even Carnap. I mean, epistemology is holistic. Uh, what you're in a position, what the epistemic uh, connections are uh, between evidence and conclusion is uh, is um, dependent on facts uh, of this kind. So um, this is supposed to be an example of, of that kind. Now you can talk lots of examples. Here's one I talked to in the past. Um, suppose you're playing a game in which you're presented with a bunch of random factual statements in pairs, and you're told that the truth value of the two statements within each pair is the same. So they're either both true or both false. So you might have things like, you know, I say um, um, Milan is further north than Boston, in latitude, um, latitude, longitude, whatever it is. Um, 
Uh, so that's one statement. Another, the rainfall in Mexico City, average annual rainfall, is greater than it is in New York City. Uh, nothing to do with each other, these statements. But suppose these, uh, again, I don't even know the answers to these questions, but you have pairs like this and you're asked to, um, to, to guess whether they're both true or both false. These are cases where if you happen to know one of the facts, you can infer the other from it. So if you had the evidence that uh, uh, Milan was further north than Boston, assuming that it is, um, if you had that evidence, you would be able to conclude that the other sentence in the pair was true as well. Or if you knew it was false, you'd be able to infer the other one's false. So this is an epistemic connection which is wholly contrived uh, by uh, presenting uh, a person with certain uh, testimonial evidence uh, which gives them reason to make the connection. But no one should look for connections in the world to sort of stand behind the legitimacy of the inference from one of these things to, to the other. So you cannot move directly from epistemic relations to um, relations of, the, of some kind between facts that the propositions are uh, about. But the observation about the fragility of epistemic and the variability dependent on context of epistemic relevance does not mean that it's not possible to find some more general principles uh, about epistemic relations. That is to more general statements grounded in facts which generalizations about when, at least under normal conditions, um, uh, g g explain why it's reasonable to make an inference from, one, from evidence to uh, conclusion. He, uh, so uh, if there were rules of this kind, rules which tell you if this kind of connection holds in the world, then normally it's uh, um, from learning that one of these facts, one of these propositions is true, what g gives you evidence for the other, uh, then that would be give you reason to try to find out those kinds of facts. But the generalizations will have to be defeasible because given that the very same thing that normally is evidence for not deductive evidence but inductive evidence for a certain conclusion is compatible with it being evidence for the opposite conclusion in other circumstances. But it still might be that one can find some generalizations which will have exceptions when the epistemic situation is more contrived in certain ways uh, than, uh, than it does. So this is sort of a, an aim that one can reasonably have and it's clear enough before we get to the question of constructive um, explanation uh, of a general kind, it's clear enough that counterfactuals play a role in stating such generalizations, in making inductive generalizations. So look at a further reflections on the Sly Pete um, riverboat story um, to see this. So Sly Pete did, as expected, fold. That is, he had the losing hand, he knew he had the losing hand, and so he didn't take, he didn't uh, 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 see the bat, but instead folded. Uh, but what would have happened if he had called? Now, let's ask the counterfactual question. Despite the fact that Zach, the one informant who knew both, knew that, that Pete knew both hands, uh, despite the fact that Zach made no mistake when he said if Pete called, he won, it's clear enough that if Pete had called, he would have lost. Why is this clear enough? Well, this counterfactual um, uh, helps to explain both why Pete didn't call um, since he knew that the counterfactual was true. 
It was because he knew the counterfactual was true that he chose not to see the bet. And it also explains why Zach, the informant, was in a position to make the uh, indicative conditional claim that he made. That is, Zach could have reasoned, and this is the bottom of the handout on the first page, Zach could have reasoned in this way, Pete, uh, this is Zach speaking now to himself, Pete knows uh, uh, what the cards are in both hands. So therefore he knows whether or not he has a winning hand. Now if he has a losing hand, um, uh, then he knows he would lose if he called, and so therefore uh, he won't call unless he has a winning hand. Um, Zach doesn't know that the counterfactual is true, that if he called, if he had called, he would have lost, but he knows that if he has a losing hand, he does know that this, counterf that this counterfactual is true, and Pete knows that it's true. So this is an example of the use on the basis of Zach of a counterfactual conditional as playing a role in why he has the, why he's in a position to make the uh, inference that, the inductive inference from his evidence that he made. Uh, and it's saying Dorothy Edgington emphasizes this in her uh, work, even though she rejects the idea that counterfactuals have truth values, but she wants to say we use counterfactuals in empirical inferences to conclusions about what is actually the case. That is, again, this is the question, what's the role of counterfactuals? Why does what would be true if things that we know aren't true were true, why is this uh, of any interest if we're, we're interested in what goes on in the real world? And as she emphasizes, and as I want to emphasize, it's a, um, they, they play a central role in epistemic um, reasoning. Just a few more examples uh, of a kind that Edgington also talks about. Uh, first kind of example is a counterfactual modus tollens, um, which Zach's reasoning uh, is one example, although he doesn't fully know, the, but it's conditional uh, reasoning. But um, if the gardener had done it, there would have been muddy footprints in the garden, but there weren't any, so therefore, he must not be the guilty party. So here we use a counterfactual belief. Uh, again, we're not explaining how you know counterfactuals. We're just explaining that if you, we, if you have them, what role they're going to play in inductive uh, reasoning, why it's important, why they, uh, there's something we want to know. Um, and when then our explanation of how we know them and what they are, what they say, is going to be given partly in terms of what must they say in order to explain the uses that we recognize that they have. Okay, second kind of uh, uh, example, based on a famous uh, example by Alan Anderson, uh, and I'll say a minute about what Anderson wanted to use that example to show. The example is if she had taken arsenic, then she would have uh, she would be showing exactly the symptoms that she is in fact showing. This statement is made in the course of giving an inductive argument for the conclusion that she took arsenic. So we say, um, uh, in effect, it's sort of hypothetical deductive reasoning. Here's a hypothesis. She took, um, she took arsenic. If that hypothesis were true, then um, uh, the following facts would obtain, and they do obtain. Um, now, Anderson's point uh, of this example, using this example, was to, um, to show that the concept of a subjunctive conditional, the things that are distinctively, uh, must be stated in the, uh, the distinctive grammatical form, uh, that has the woods and the, uh, and the past tense in it, uh, is not 
the same as counterfactual. So a counterfactual is a um, somewhat often defined as a conditional proposition where it's presupposed that the antecedent is false. But here, we're arguing for the antecedent, so it's definitely not presupposed that the antecedent is false. But notice that the indicative version of this conditional would be wholly uh, inappropriate and wouldn't do the work that this one does. That is, the indicative version would be, if she took arsenic, then she's showing just the symptoms that she's showing. You can say, well, yeah, if she didn't take arsenic, she's also showing just the symptoms that she's showing. So the indicative is trivial, um, but the subjunctive is necessary in order to state the kind of fact that you're trying to state, the fact which is the one that plays the role in epistemic reasoning. So one way to think about this example is it's kind of like this. You say, well, we know the symptoms, but let's pretend we didn't. That is, suspend the presupposition that she's showing just the, uh, the symptoms that she's showing. And then ask your case, uh, say, even under that condition, even under this sort of more robust condition about our particular local epistemic situation, we still would be in a position to infer um, from the hypothesis that she has arsenic, that she's showing just these symptoms. So the idea is, the, the point of the, um, the subjunctive here, so-called subjunctive, is to show, the, is to say, cancel for the moment the, uh, the presupposition that we know about the symptoms. And we're still in a position to make the conditional claim. And that's why we put it in the subjunctive to indicate that we're canceling some presupposition. But if you think, um, what we're looking for in terms of finding generalizations uh, uh, for helping us understand generalizations about uh, inductive reasoning, um, then we're looking for assumptions which are robust, for which would obtain um, uh, even in circumstances which were different in the local uh, particular uh, information that we have. So I might want to say in a wide variety of contexts with a wide variety of uh, differences in the local information that is available to us, in many of those situations we would be in a position to infer if she took arsenic she will show some symptoms XYZ. So therefore if we find symptoms XYZ that's uh, inductive support for the hypothesis. Okay, so what we're looking for is ways of generalizing about the world which give us robust generalizations uh, about how we do inductive uh, inference. Um, um, so in general, and the reason why this sort of hypothetical deductive reasoning, I mean, in general, to, ass uh, to assess the force of evidence received, we consider how likely it, uh, we would have that, received that evidence on the various alternative hypotheses. So those are counterfactual suppositions, and they play a very natural and unclear role in the kind of inductive reasoning we, we engage in. So the general idea of the projection strategy, which is the alternative to reduction that I want to uh, explore, is, um, uh, is that we, uh, we're taking, uh, we're, we're, we're looking for inductive relations, uh, we generalize about them which we can project or find in the world. Uh, uh, and so then uh, once we have a certain hypothesis, there will be all kinds of different evidence that might be relevant to that hypothesis, and, uh, uh, but um, uh, we use counterfactuals in reasoning uh, about them. Okay, so more generally, it's not just counterfactuals, but more generally the contrast, this is the beginning paragraph in the sec middle of the second page of the handout on for the projection strategy, the contrast between indicative and subjunctive conditionals is just one example of a range of modal concepts uh, which come in pairs or family, pairs of families of, uh, of words that express these ideas, um, uh, subjective or epistemic and objective. 
So uh, uh, it's familiar that modal might and must um, have a circumstantial and epistemic uh, a reason. Uh, for, so you, you, uh, we find natural necessity is reason about uh, which we locate in the world, is necessity of some kind that we locate in the world, the kind that Hume was suspicious of and wanted to explain. Um, but the epistemic ones, uh, for all I know, it might be, are much easier in some ways for the empiricists to, to understand. Um, but uh, may and might uh, is just one. Probability is another. Familiar distinction between subjective probability, degree of belief, degree of credence on the one hand, and objective probability, chance, on the other. And the empiricist is comfortable with, uh, with subjective probability, with degree of belief, sort of behavioristic accounts of how that works, um, in, more in the empiricist tradition. Skepticism about objective chance uh, as being something that's uh, dubious. Um, there's relations of relevance and irrelevance, which are epistemic. Uh, some th evidence is relevant uh, to some hypothesis or irrelevant to that hypothesis. In uh, the, there's there are, uh, notions of dependence and independence, which we locate in the facts. Facts are dependent on each other or independent of each other. Um, explanatory relations, causation is a kind of, the causal explanation is trying to uh, use um, certain kinds of um, facts about the causal structure of the world to exp uh, explain, um, uh, explain uh, things, but epi uh, explanation is, is also um, an epistemic uh, notion. Um, so, uh, one has a wide range, just looking at in, intuitions about um, modal concepts between these two kinds of things. And the general, as we saw, the general sort of empiricist um, bias, uh, not bias in a pejorative sense, but just uh, um, 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 their principles of, of what needs to be clarification is that the, the subjective notions are uh, simpler and easier to understand, and we want to somehow use them to help understand the um, understand the more objective ones to the extent we can at all. Um, and one of the sort of ideas here then is to take the objective content uh, concepts generally to be projections of the subjective uh, ones onto the world, the epistemic ones onto the world. Now, the interesting thing about the projection strategy is that. It begins as a kind of uh, explanation for a mistake, right? And all the uh, examples I'm going to uh, give are examples um, where um, uh, at least um, one proponent of, of the view regards it as a kind of error, uh, the projection, as if uh, and, and, but I want to suggest there's an alternative way of understanding the projection strategy, which is more constructive and less critical. Okay, so starting with Hume on causation, which is the sort of um, 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 starting point uh, of the uh, idea here. Um, so quoting Hume again, on the whole, uh, necessity is something that exists in the mind. Uh, and is and not in objects. Nor is it this is nor is it possible for us to form even the most distant idea of it um, considered as a quality in bodies. So the idea is to the the problem with the idea of natural necessity is it's a projection uh, of uh, an idea which is which essentially has to do with relations of ideas. Uh, onto uh, the world, to sort of locate it in the world where it doesn't belong. So, um, the, again, the Humean distinction between matters of fact and relation of ideas, uh, ideas are connected in semantic, we would say, he emphasizes the sort of mentalistic side, but uh, more contemporary, or not contemporary, but 
modern, modern um, empiricists would have put the emphasis on semantic uh, relations of ideas. So the, the idea that one, um, uh, one proposition entails another or the application of one concept entails the application of another. This is a relation of ideas of things, but it doesn't give you any conclusions about distinct matters of fact. So no relation of ideas can give you a connection between, or be a rationale for a connection between one event and a distinct event taking place at a different uh, time. So causal connections, which are distinction, connections between distinct events, the very idea that there should be a necessary connection is, an, is a mistake. Um, so again, the idea, you know, we start with the idea that Humean idea, Humean uh, uh, presupposition, um, that uh, all ideas are copies of impressions, um, or somehow reducible to things that are copies of impressions, then um, the notion of necessity uh, is not an impression, it's something wholly in the realm of ideas, and so uh, it's not something which uh, can give you an idea at all. You can't form any idea at all involving the notion of necessity in a coherent idea of connections between facts. Um, now, but Hume goes on to say, but, um, uh, well, this isn't a quotation, but a uh, necessary connection properly understood is a relation of ideas, while you cannot, according to Hume, form a coherent idea of necessary connection between facts or events we can explain the source of the illusion that we have such an idea. So the source of the illusion, the illusory idea, is a projection of something in the mind uh, onto um, the world. And here we have the kind of association of psychology, which says, you know, you, you keep seeing event of type A followed by event of type B, and you form an association which, cr which brings it about that when you f have the one idea, you um, tend to have the other one as well in either direction. And that, um, that association you take to be something you find in the world, whereas it's actually something that just arises and explained in terms of, of psychology. Now, the... Um, <coughs> Many people who are not sympathetic to the Humean um, uh, whole uh, project uh, would say, you know, this is, you're, Hume is giving a causal explanation for why we have the idea of causation, which is an illegitimate idea. So the association of psychology is a, is a causal theory. And I think in some ways, uh, uh, Hume would not have disagreed with that. So there's got to be some sense in which causation is a legitimate notion if, uh, if we can go on comfortably and use it. And of course, there's a familiar tension which all the Hume scholars talk about between Hume, uh, Hume's naturalism, his uh, his psychology and his overall theory about the nature of the mind um, on the one hand and his skepticism on the other. So skepticism about causation goes together with using causation in your theory. And uh, um, Hume gives what he called a, a, um, a skeptical solution to uh, problems about causation and problems about induction. Now what exactly is a skeptical solution is somewhat, in general, somewhat obscure, but the basic idea of Hume's theory was, or Hume's explanation was, look, uh, we have a skeptical argument that no inductive principles can ever be justified, but uh, we also have find ourselves in a situation where we can't help forming beliefs about the world. Uh, it just happens, and we have a causal explanation for why it happens. So we have a skeptical argument, which is sort of viewed from the inside, trying to give 
a justification making no assumptions for using the principles we use. We say, we can't do that, but we can do something else. We can describe uh, uh, ourselves and how we form beliefs, and we can theorize about it. In theorizing about it, we're using inductive principles, and we're using the notion of causation, and we're using those notions partly to explain how we get those uh, ideas. So we shift to this external perspective uh, where we take for granted that we have beliefs and we can reason about them using our inductive procedures. We'll see there's something very similar in the way Goodman um, talks about induction. Um, but more explicitly, I mean, he, with Hume, it's, um, um, it's, it's really hard to reconcile uh, the th things he says in different parts of his, uh, in his, his theory. So, but at least in terms of thinking, just focusing on this narrow notion of projection, one way to, to resolve, this is on the third page of the handout, one way to resolve the tension is to give a more positive interpretation of the very idea of the projection of mental associations onto things in the world. That is to explain it as a pattern of concept formation rather than as a confusion of categories. And again, I'm not suggesting that Hume would reconcile uh, the views. It may be difficult to explain so many of the texts on this on this hypothesis, but I think it's a way of, of uh, uh, making uh, the different things fit together, even if they're not his way of making them fit together. Um, but it, one of the things that's clear is that when he's in his naturalistic uh, mode, uh, Hume puts great emphasis on the role of causation in inductive reasoning. So. The final quotation in the Hume part of this, uh, all reasoning concerning matters of fact um, seem to be founded on the notions, um, uh, on the relation of cause and effect. By means of that relation alone, we can go beyond the evidence of our memory and our senses. So we can go beyond our evidence. We can make inductive inferences. We just can't justify them. And if we give a more descriptive account of what we're doing, then we say we can note that causal concepts play a crucial role in that uh, reasoning. Um, so there's got to be something legitimate about causation, according to Hume. Maybe uh, a, a sort of different part of it that, that the, the Lewis, in his picking up of Humean themes, emphasizes is the reductionist part, the part that, well, while there's no necessary connection in cause, there are regularities. But the regularities don't help us to explain inductive procedure. We can use, if we, if we could know regularities, then we could use them in inductive reasoning. But how do we know them? So we don't, we don't have any kind of explanation for our, uh, why our inductive procedures work. Okay, so um, second, uh, Example, and this is something I'm going to talk about on the last, uh, in the last lecture on Friday in more detail, is the notion of dispositional properties, and in particular what Goodman has to say in fact, fiction, and forecast about dis dispositional properties. So one motivation for the search for a reductive analysis of counterfactuals originally for Goodman, as we talked about, was um, to, to provide us with resources for the, anal uh, the analysis of dispositional properties, uh, such as fragile, uh, flexible, observable, and so forth. And Goodman thought the range of concepts that are dispositional was extremely broad. So color properties are dispositional, according to, um, according to a Goodman, because he took the color experiences to be more fundamental, and uh, the, to find color in the world is to find properties which dispose us to have certain experiences. So 
Uh, it isn't just the ibl and the abl words, he says, that are dispositions, but a wide range of uh, properties. And this goes with kind of what Ayer emphasized in talking about um, uh, what he took to be the inductive, the reductive base for, um, is, is that any kind of talk of the objective world is talk about dispositional features of the world, and we explain how we test for those things in terms of counterfactuals. Um, um, okay, so the Goodman says after his acknowledged failure on his own terms in giving a reductive analysis of counterfactuals, says maybe, or I suspect, that the problem of dispositions is really simpler than the problem of counterfactuals. So the idea was to turn to that problem rather than to try to explain counterfactuals first. Now why are they, why might it be simpler? Um, uh, we'll see why the, the, the analysis of disposition in terms of counterfactuals has counterexamples as much discussed in the literature on dispositions. But part of, the, part of Goodman's reason for taking more simp uh, is that the logical structure of dispositional predicates is much more straightforward, unproblematic, than the logical structure of counterfactuals, which is obscure. Um, and that's what the sort of logics of counterfactuals that were developed helped to clarify that problem. But at Goodman's time, the sort of no understanding of exactly how the logic should work, or whether there was a clear way the logic should, uh, should work. But predicates are just predicates, right? Monadic predicates. So the disposition, the property of being fragile or flexible is simply um, a property. And we know that its, its logical structure is to uh, have an extension. And to, uh, I mean, he didn't, Goodman was skeptical about properties and intentions, but if you're not, you can say it's, it's to express a property. A, a, predicate, a dispositional predicate expresses a property. And it's clear enough what a property is. It's something that is, things have under certain conditions. Um, so one of the reasons for thinking disposition might be simpler is their logical structure is, is simpler. But also I think the main thing he does in, in uh, going on to look at the problem of dispositions is not to look for a reductive analysis of dispositions, but rather to simply connect them with inductive procedure. So um, think of what we're doing when we do inductive inference. We have an observable, we have, we have a, a, a bunch of observations, and we project um, the generalizations we find in the observations onto the unobservable. That's what inductive inference is. So the only way to see it is the projection of observed regularities onto unobserved regularities. And the problem of induction is the problem of what are the generalizations we use to do that. Um, so Goodman noted, you know, you can't solve the problem of induction along the lines that Hume wanted to solve it. You can't give a uh, an analysis of why, a, a, a justification from the inside of why um, we should use certain um, inductive, we should take nature to be uniform in certain respects and not in other respects. But what we can do is describe, and this is something like Hume's shift to the skeptical solution, we can describe induction. And it turns out to be a lot harder than you might think to describe induction. So Goodman's constructive project concerning induction, as developed in the later chapters of Fact, Fiction, and Forecast, was to try to state um, the, um, the rules by which we make inductions. And it turned out you needed to distinguish certain predicates from other predicates, Gru and Bleen-like predicates from red and uh, green and blue like um, predicates and we needed to explain how we make that distinction. So, um, but the main thing that he does in 
addressing the problem of induction is to say, look, the relationship between observation, what's observed and what's unobserved, which is essential to inductive reasoning, is also involved at a conceptual level between, well, he wouldn't have put it in terms of concepts and all, but uh, in the way we project a concept onto another concept. So we have the distinction between things that flex and things that fail to flex, which are th all things that are subject to, um, to a test condition. Some of them pass the test, others fail. But then there's a bunch that are never subjected to the test condition. So we say, we hypothesize that there's a property, although Goodman wouldn't have put it this way, um, that explains why flexible, why certain things flex and other things don't, but it's a property that things have even if they're not subjected to the test condition. Um, that's an empirical hypothesis that there are such properties. We say whatever the rules are for justifying this kind of projection, conceptual projection of extending our, uh, of, of introducing predicates um, which have the wider extension based as a generalization of predicates that have a narrow one, whatever rules we use to do that are exactly the same rules we use to make inductive projection from the observed to the unobserved. So we haven't solved a problem. The problem of induction, the descriptive problem of induction remains, but we've tied two problems together. The problem of uh, conceptual projection that's involved in dispositional properties and the problem of induction. Um, so I take this to be a paradigm example of the projection strategy, but regarded as a more positive contribution rather than as simply as a criticism. So it's not that in the mind we make inductive inferences and it's a mistake to think that there's something in the world that goes with them, but um, um, but it's rather the same procedures for justifying the claim that there is something in the world uh, is um, uh, the same um, 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 a process is involved and is legitimate in the, should, we should think legitimate in the one if it's legitimate in the other. Okay, third uh, example of the projection strategy, and, and this is the example which is not closely connected to the problem of dispositions, but a very specific uh, theory uh, by a distinguished Italian, uh, 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 not really a philosopher, but philosopher and statistician, theorist of, sta of statistics, um, uh, which is uh, a kind of projection of subjective probability onto the world to form a notion of objective probability. At least that's one way to understand um, uh, one upshot of a mathematical result that De Finetti, uh, Bruno De Finetti, um, develops. So let me just describe, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the context of theorizing about dispositions, but uh, describe um, the representation theorem, which is a purely mathematical result, and then look at one kind of interpretation of it. Um, so what Definetti proved uh, was that given certain, condition, uh, certain assumptions about the structure of a purely subjective probability function, uh, which represents degrees of belief, one could represent that credence function as a mixture of probability functions satisfying a stronger condition. That is, the mixture means you can say the probability of such and such is equal to a weighted average of a bunch of other probability functions weighted by um, 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 by, by some parameter. Um, so, um, um, I mean, that's the mathematical uh, result. And, and, and uh, the, 
the conditions which the initial probability function has to meet uh, is that the, there's a, the probability function is defined on a set of basic events, events or propositions, as philosophers call them, statisticians call them events, um, but they're proposition-like truth, truth conditional things, um, are all um, events which are exchangeable. And you can, I'm not going to talk here in detail about exactly what that means, but, uh, exchange, but the, the rough idea is very simple. It's that um, uh, take any, um, any conjunction or disjunction of events of this kind and uh, permute all the basic uh, properties with each other uh, and um, the probability of the permuted proposition or event will be the same as the probability of the original one. So the idea is take something like, suppose the events are uh, an infinite sequence of flips of a, of a coin, a coin of unknown bias. Um, um, the probability of three heads in a row followed by six tails is the same as the probability of any uh, sequence of um, three and six, of nine flips, which consists of three heads and six tails. Here you can sort of permute the whole thing and take any part of the infinite sequence, and that will have the same probability. That's what it is for the events to be exchangeable. Okay, so then the claim is if we have a sequence of exchangeable events, a probability function um, which satisfies the test condition of, of exchangeability, then that probability function can be represented as a mixture of probability functions where the events are stochastically independent, much stronger condition. So are the events are st stochastically independent just in case any conjunction of events is equal to the product of the conjunction of the separate events. So the probability of heads on flip seven uh, heads on flip nine is equal to the conjunction of the probability of um, heads on uh, the one flip and heads on, on the other. Uh, and of course all the uh, heads events will have the same probability but also their conjunctions will have, um, will have uh, reduced, so you reduce it all to the probabilities of a, of a single events. Now that's a much stronger condition uh, but it's a condition which would be satisfied by a chance function. So suppose we had a sequence, suppose the sequence of events was a chance sequence with an unknown bias of the coin. So the coin, say, might have a bias one-third, as a matter of fact. Then the, um, then the probability of two heads in a row would be one-third times one-third. So the stochastic independence condition would be met even if the coin was biased. So the idea is that the sequence of flips is independent stochastically just in case the coin doesn't change as we go. It retains, a pro in terms of the sort of using the uncritical notion of chance, it retains the property of having a certain chance disposition. Okay, so basically you could see Dufinetti's result as an argument that, um, uh, showing that, you can always represent, provided your initial degrees of belief over a space of events which just involves coin flips, just observable events, because you can observe whether the coin lands heads or tails. So we have a sequence of observable events, and all the propositions definable in terms of those events uh, can be given then a probability function, your, your degrees of belief about what's going to happen of each, each of those things. If it's exchangeable, then you could see this as if it were a case where you thought there are two facts. There's a fact about the bias, and there's the fact that the coin is, um, is uh, the flips are independent of each other, causally independent of each other. Um, but that's all, that's all in the representation. There's nothing in the world, he said, about chance. Uh, it's rather that the events are just observable events, and that's your whole algebra, is, is, is those, those events. Uh, but you could see it as a, 
uh, a distribution over chance functions defined on those events, where the parameters in the mixing are probabilities that this is the right chance. So if you had a situation where the coin is either biased for heads, uh, two-thirds, uh, one-third, or biased for tails, uh, two-thirds, one-third, and it's a 50-50 chance of each, but we don't know which, then you would have an exchangeable degrees of belief on the uh, events, and as you learn more and more, uh, as you get more and more evidence about flips, then um, the parameters will change, and uh, it will become more and more likely that uh, the coin has a one-third bias, a two-thirds, one-third bias, uh, in one direction or the other, depending on wh which it is. So then you can, uh, you can prove that you would actually be able to gather evidence about this unobservable fact, if it were a fact. Now, as I said, in, and we'll look, we can look more, this is not really a separate example from the dispositional case, it's the more specific version of it, because you can think of chance as a dispositional uh, property, a dispositional property which is grounded in uh, degrees of belief, that it's reasonable to have under those uh, conditions. Okay, so now as I say, Dufinetti is a resolute subjectivist who regarded his theorem as explaining the appearance of objective probability. Why do we incline to, um, to think there's such a thing as chance? And we have this sort of robust belief and it plays a role in our inductive theorizing. It's because um, we, uh, we can interpret um, uh, the appearance of this objective feature as something that's derivative from the properties of a purely subjective probability um, function. So the more constructive way, so Dufinetti thought this is, this is an explanation of an error, uh, how we can help ourselves to the notion of chance without really believing in it. But you can also see it as a more constructive uh, account as saying why if there were such a property as chance, the empiricist is skeptical about theoretical properties. You can't observe directly the, um, the chance of a coin. All you can do is flip it a lot of times and then make some judgments about it on the basis of that. But Dufinetti's theorem also helps to explain why if there were such a property, then we would have reason, we would have reason to take the flips of the coin as evidence for that, uh, that chance. And we'll be able to explain how the ordinary Bayesian reasoning, which involves hypotheses about chance, and the probability for Bayesian reasoning where you take the probability of the evidence uh, to be relation, the probability of a hypothesis given evidence is related to the probability of evidence given hypothesis, and, uh, and we can explain how you use those kinds of things to do inductive um, reasoning. Okay, so the idea is here we have, recall A.J. Ayer's remark, it's only uh, at some level of theory that we can form uh, any picture of the objective world only in some theory that we can go beyond chance events, just the flips themselves, to something underlying them that explains them. Uh, but we, use, we need uh, the theoretical resources provided by counterfactual conditionals, dispositional properties, powers, capacities, dependencies, in order to give an adequate description of the objective world. The anti-reductionist thesis about such ideas about natural necessity is not that there is a level of theory that is irreducible to the level of fact, but it's rather that there is no level of fact that is characterize, characterizable, uh, characterizable independently of theory. Where theory here refers to powers, dispositions, relations of causal dependence, independence, and so on. And what the projection strategy suggests is that the process of 
forming a theoretical picture of the objective world proceeds direct, uh, uh, proceeds sort of in interaction with, together with, the process of forming inductive policies by which we test and confirm that theoretical picture. So as, as Hume suggests, causal notions will play an essential role in our characterization of our reasoning about matters of fact. But we can't get any causal ideas until we've already done some inductive reasoning. So we've got to sort of march together with these views in forming inductive procedures. Now the thing I'm going to emphasize in the last uh, couple of lectures is the central role that a notion of independence, a causal notion of independence plays in all of these stories, the story of Goodman's, the story of Diffinetti's, and so on. And in general, you can say how a notion of independence plays a very strong role in our ordinary thinking about inductive procedure. Why do you need random samples? Um, uh, what is a random sample? So the idea is you use a property of a population to pick out a sample, which is known to be causally independent of the property you're testing for. Well, who knows what's causally independent of what, right? You might be not very knowledgeable about what the causal relationships are between things in this population. But one thing we know, if you take a randomizing device and select members of your population using that random device, that there isn't any causal connection between the properties of things in the population and properties of your device, which, uh, which, um, which might lead to a bias uh, of selection. And once there was an example of Henry Kyberg gave, of somebody who didn't bother to randomize, what they said is, well, we want to know that how many Scotsmen there are in the population. So we'll pick a random part of the chunk of the phone book and just take all the people as our sample there. Chose the letter M, you know, we'll just do the, the letter M. Found out there's a huge number of Scotsmen because their names all start with Mac, you know I mean? So if you just pick a property casually, you're, you're, you may wind up with one that happens to be correlated causally with the thing you're trying to test for in the population. But uh, you're looking for something independent and we have procedures uh, inductive procedures developed for ensuring that things are causally independent. So the role of causal independence in inductive reasoning is clear. So I think and it's also clear that that's closely connected to an idea of, of the kind of closeness and similarity that we're looking for in finding criteria for, uh, for selecting worlds to interpret uh, uh, counterfactuals. Um, Okay, so that's, we'll look more about notion of independence, in particular, find out the notion of independence is also relevant to play, and plays an essential role in practical reasoning. Um, and that's another place where counterfactuals play a crucial role. So I'm gonna emphasize next time, look at, at some, review some things about decision theory and game theory, and look at the role of cause, assumptions about causal structure in those theories, and, um, and see something about how, um, uh, how one application of, of the notion of counterfactual is to, uh, to practical reasoning. And then we'll put it together with some uh, talk of both uh, practical and, and uh, epistemic issues in, uh, with dispositional properties on the fourth day, fifth day. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, Okay, so Dave. Thanks very much. Um, just a quick clarification, something you said quite early on, um, and it might actually be an invitation for you to defend something you don't believe but someone else does. Uh, so you mentioned that someone like Edgington thinks that counterfactuals don't have truth values, uh, mm -hmm. but also that she thinks that you can use counterfactuals in reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, so when I teach my students, I tell them that good arguments have true premises. Mm -hmm. um, how could you have those two things together? How can you have Edgington's belief that counterfactuals don't have truth values, but also have them as sort of little atoms of reasoning towards conclusions? Good, okay, so... Um 
So stepping back first and saying more, more generally, the, as we, the first day we say um, uh, the, the conditional assertion story, um, which Dorothy Edgington likes, uh, is much more, uh, more easier to spell out and more natural and clear in the case of indicative conditionals. Um, the extension to counterfactuals is more difficult. But she wants to insist that while counterfactuals are expressing um, objective facts of a certain kind, um, that is, or they're expressing, expressing something objective about the world, they're not stating propositions that have truth values. So um, the explanation of what a counterfactual assertion is um, is going to involve objective probability. Um, and exactly how, uh, so in, in some ways, she's not a skeptic, she's not a Humean skeptic. Uh, she's not someone who's skeptical about um, the notions of causal independence and the notion of chance, but um, uh, wants to locate, wants to, to have a theory that has objectivity without truth values. In this so the idea is that a, a counterfactual might be highly probable. Even, and whether it's, how probable it is objectively might be, or no, it's not that the proposition itself is obj objective, but it's, it should be expressed by a chance conditional relationship. So, um, and again, I'm, um, um, a lot of problems of detail about how, how to work things out, but that's, that's the general, uh, the general strategy as I understand it. So, I mean, in particular, she gives the example, which you talked a little bit about uh, one, one of the days, uh, of um, um, plane crash. The, 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 um, the fortune teller said, if you take that plane, you'll be killed. Uh, she dismisses this as ridiculous, based on tea leaves and so on, so no point. And she, uh, but she misses the plane through independent uh, considerations, and, um, and the plane, in fact, does crash. And she says, that's just a horrible coincidence. But nevertheless, she says, but she was right. I would have been killed if I'd taken that plane. So it looks like they're running right, because this seems to be a paradigm example of something that's true, or at least correctly asserted, even though unjustified by the person who asserted it. It's not unjustified by her now, but it's unjustified by the original. So you have a clear distinction between what's um, assertable or reasonable and what's true. But we don't want to use truth, we want to, but what's objective or something like that. So, but so he wants to extend the notion of objectivity to apply to a chance uh, relationship. Then she goes on to sort of justify that by saying, you know, it could have happened that uh, 85% of the people were killed on the plane, and um, they were pretty much distributed through the plane, so um, uh, even if, if she had taken it, um, it was about an 85% chance she would have been killed. Um, um, and so we want to say that's as far as you can go as far as objective facts are concerned. Um, Okay, so that's, that's her view. Now, my view, taking these things to be propositions, uh, has to allow for truth value graphs with propositions. So I want to say, uh, and in fact, one of the interesting things is that this doesn't happen with vagueness, I don't think. It isn't that vague statements, we say, well, sort of neither true or false, that he's bald, not true that he's not bald, but, uh, He's 85% bald, so we know we don't say that. You know, we, maybe we could have an 85% head of hair, but that doesn't mean 85% bald. 85% uh, bald would have a lot less than 85% hair. So, uh, if there were such a notion. Uh, so, but nevertheless, there are cases where um, where we have truth value gaps, where we do want to talk about uh, probability. So, the theorist who believes in um, that there's no the, no fact of the matter about the future. There will be a fact of the matter, but it's not one anyone now. But there are probability values about the future. So there can be chance events. Uh, it's already set 
that uh, there's an 80 percent chance there'll be a sea battle tomorrow, and we can we can assert that as being now true, uh, even though there's no fact of the matter about things. So we can have things that are neither true nor false, which have probability values, and I think that can happen with uh, with chance. Thanks very much, Roberto. Thank you. Um, so, at, I wonder at which conditions is projection of the subjective of onto the word tenable or um, maybe in more descriptive terms at which conditions can it be performed so I'm, I'm thinking about this um, take human causation uh -huh. on the one hand we have undefeated beliefs on regularities so undefeated conditional beliefs that you have something and conditionally on that uh -huh. something else follows on the one hand. On the other hand, we have causal connections, causal relations, okay, some, that's the, let's say, result of the projection. Yeah. Okay, but in many formal theories, beliefs have a very non-monotonic flavor. I'm thinking of the conditional beliefs in the sphere systems by you, Lewis, Groove, Olivier Board, and Causation seems to have not, at least according to the theories that see causes as sufficient conditions. So, my question is, given a phenomenon, belief uh -huh. about regularities that has certain logical features, like a non-monotonic flavor, and given its subjective counterpart, effect of the projection, that, has, that hasn't these features, okay, what's the ingredient, what's the thing that would bridge the two. Uh -huh. Why are we mm, entitled? Why, why is it legitimate, as I think it is, to project? Uh -huh. Good, uh, good. Yeah, yeah well, that's a good question. And part of the idea of here of, of um, saying that the process of forming inductive rules and the process and sort of uh, refining our notion of how we uh, what good scientific reasoning is in a case where you're uncertain about things proceeds together with um, forming theory. So you learn some things about there were some very general things which hypotheses about the world maybe with high qualification which you think we now have good reason to believe those things. Um, and then that helps you to see why certain more specific procedures are reasonable for um, for testing uh, for things we don't yet uh, know. In doing so, the, the steps of projection are going to be hyp uh, hypothesis formation, which are defeasible, subject to refutation. So, I mean, again, the example with, with the chance um, kind of thing, um, um, the example of a dispositional property, so one finds that there are certain people who are really good at, um, re, uh, uh, they, they really, um, they, they seem to win a lot of chance games and they, you know, they buy lottery tickets, they win more often than, than most people and, uh, and so on. And, and you know, of course, there's always gonna be people like that and people who are unlucky. So I say, well, there is this dispositional property, lucky. And even the people who don't ever bet on chance uh, 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 don't know how to play these games. They don't gamble. Right? Some of them are lucky and they should gamble. And others are not lucky and they shouldn't. Right? So I might hypothesize that there is some property. And in a world with more um, supernatural um, uh, features, maybe there would be. You know, God has certain chosen people who he rewards with um, uh, good luck and others. Not, um, but uh, so one might form that hypothesis and one might then proceed on the hypothesis that, that there is a property uh, which applies to uh, the betting people and we can project it onto the non-betting uh, people. Um, and you know, we might try to go out and try to test for it by forcing them to bet uh, or something like that. When we find, we, we, we're gonna find it correlates with certain other things. As part of the strategy of, of finding 
uh, or assessing a dispositional property is finding correlations between the property you hypothesize and other properties which you test for in other ways. So it, uh, I suspect that anybody who forms the luck hypothesis is going to find they just don't get anywhere when they try to find other correlations. And so that turns out to be a bad projection. And uh, that's an extreme case, a silly case, but um, there are many other intermediate kind of cases where you, know, you, you haven't really got to the bottom of it yet. You sort of got a superficial uh, property which correlates sort of with some other things. But we then can divide it into separate more fine-grained properties and get more and more um, um, connect, interconnection between different properties. So the, the project of um, projection is going to be an empirical uh, project which is subject to um, uh, 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 misstarts uh, as, as you go. So that, does that help address what you're worried about? Or? Well, partly, but I was more interested in two, I mean, the, the, the issue was, um, uh, I believe the, there might be a gap in the logical properties that we have when we reason about, uh, the example I made, beliefs, mm -hmm. and uh, when we reason about causes, that is. I mean, my question wasn't about how we empirically go and test mm -hmm. the hypothesis in the projection. My, my question was about the logical properties of the two different phenomena. Uh -huh. So that it, it was more on, yeah. you good, have these good. phenomena yeah. with two different mm -hmm. set of mathematical logical properties and at which conditions, ideally. Right, um, good, okay, yeah. so I see, right. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's right that um, if you generalize about pure um, epistemic reasoning uh, with conditionals but also with, uh, w with some other like belief revision structure and so on that you're interested in, um, um, uh, there will be certain features uh, which, um, which are distinctive, which are um, tightly tied to um, the direct inductive application. And um, in doing the projection, as I said, given the, given the, uh, the variability and fragility of the reasoning on the pure belief level, um, you've got to um, you, uh, find generalizations which are defeasible. And that's going to give rise to a coming apart of these things, and that's going to give rise to a, 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 a different logical structure. But it's a big problem. Uh, it's, if, you're, if you're operating on the pure epistemic level, it's, as I mean, the, sub, the empiricists are right, that it's, it's a lot easier to reason about the subjective notions, the purely epistemic notions. Uh, when you start looking at um, where the defeasibility comes, uh, and, and um, why is it that the way we do it should have the different structure that it has? That, um, uh, that's a further issue, and you've got to look particularly, and we'll talk later, I mean next time, about um, lots of the causal notions uh, on a very abstract level, if we look at them abstractly, they have a kind of tree structure to them. And, um, and a strong asymmetry, and this is the thing talking about, about Lewis's uh, pro problem of trying to explain this. And we have, uh, we defending a projection kind of strategy, also have the problem, why should the background uh, causal notions give rise to a kind of tree structure, or chance does, right? and a chance uh, model. Uh, and that's a big problem, and I don't have a fully satisfactory um, explanation of why that should be, but I think that's an outstanding, uh, very abstract structural problem about, about this thing, but it's, it's, it's a good place to focus one's attention, I think. That, uh, Thank you. <laughs>
per Francesco. So maybe this is a point that has been already raised during the first lecture, but the slide peat example um, seems to suggest that one sh should... So which, which example? Slide peat example, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a slide peat story. Seems yeah. to suggest that one should relativize the selection function to the state of knowledge of an agent who utters a given conditional because uh -huh. uh, uh, relative to Zach's state of knowledge is conditional if Pete call one is true, but relative to uh, Jack's state of knowledge, which is more updated with facts, uh -huh. Uh, uh -huh. The, the very same conditional is uh, uh -huh. false. Um, and if one relativizes the selection function with respect to the state of knowledge of an agent, it comes out that in a sense, similarity or closeness among words is context dependent because it depends on, I mean, right, the right. amount of information that in, in the slide bit case, the amount of information that one uh, has access to. So, would you agree to uh, just with with that, with with the idea that uh, when we evaluate counterfactuals or conditional? using, for instance, uh, uh, notions such as uh, um, similarity or closeness, uh, we sometimes need to conceive similarity, closeness as a context-dependent matter, something that cannot uh -huh. be uh, isolated without a context and without a yeah. set of presuppositions. Mm -hmm. place. Good. No, it's right, that the, but there's a tension here between um, between um, the focus on the individual, on the individual's beliefs, and the focus on um, communication. So the Sly Pete story involves both um, uh, contrasting uh, beliefs of the informants, uh, suggesting that um, uh, that uh, since the one justifies one conditional and the other justifies what seems to be the contrary, uh, contrary conditional, that we should relativize it to their degrees of belief. But um, we also want to explain why um, the informant can tell somebody, um, can use the conditional to make a statement well, not, 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 we're not assuming it's a, fa it's a proposition, but we're assuming that it's a speech act. And we want to explain how this speech act can communicate information. If the context uh, already includes the, uh, the epistemic situation of the speaker, then what can the speaker tell the addressee uh, if, if uh, that he doesn't already know. If he tells him something he doesn't already know, then he, his context must be different if the, if the context is closely tied to um, the, uh, all the details of the epistemic situation. So that's why the, sort of the idea that in the conditional assertion account that I, I want to, to take, again, focusing more on the communicative side, we have the common ground, what's taken for granted by, uh, by everybody. And, um, and Gibbard also is assuming that and saying, well, you got a problem because um, the common uh, background between one informant and the addressee is the same as the common to the other addressee uh, and, and the um, uh, other, other speaker in the addressee. So um, the tension between, um, you know, I mean, obviously you're communicating what you believe uh, and you're communicating on the basis of the fact you believe it, but the, the idea of communication you've got to separate somehow what I'm saying f from the totality of, of my beliefs. And so that's what creates the initial, um, the initial uh, problem. But um, 
Um, you still are going to have, uh, however you address that problem, you're still going to have uh, very um, um, very strong um, dependence on the particular epistemic situation. And what you're certainly not going to get uh, on this view is something detachable which you can take away to uh, a situation w which is wholly different in terms of what everybody knows. So you're looking, when you're turning to the question of counterfactuals, you're looking for something more robust, not just for its epistemic role, but also as a proposition which once you learn it, uh, you can take it to another situation where people know different things uh, and, and tell them. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, I was trying, let's continue with this example. Suppose that I say, uh, well, I know Pete very well. He's very good at playing uh, poker. So if he knows the hand of his, the, the person he's playing with, and uh, if he calls, uh, supposing that he knows the, uh, the hand of the person he's, uh, he's playing with, if he calls, he wins. And on the other say, uh, the hand, I say, well, obviously, uh, if he knows the hand of the person who is in front of him, um, supposing that he knows the hand of the uh, person who is in front of him, and uh, he has a bad hand or a worse hand uh, uh, than uh, his, the other person, then uh, uh, obviously if he calls, he loses, but he won't call in that case. Uh -huh. That's, I, I mean, in that case, I can assert in one situation both conditionals, and uh, I'm saying, uh, I'm not contradicting myself, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. I have a related question. Uh, yeah, maybe. So well, I'm not completely getting the example here, but um, one of the things that happens in the story as it is, is the addressee, the narrator, knows that he can trust his informants. So what they told him is something he accepts. But um, he is no longer in a position to say, if Pete called, he won. Or if Pete called, he lost, on the basis of that information. Now, the, the, the addressee might say, okay, so he folded, I conclude, on the basis of my informants. But what would I think if I discovered he didn't? What would I, if, suppose they come, the room, people come out of the room and they say, Pete called. Surprise. Oh. Uh, that means one of my informants was wrong, says the, uh, which one? And that's still an epistemic question. It's not a question about the counterfactual. So either Pete missed the signal, so Zach was wrong in what he said, or the guy who looked at both hands made a mistake in uh, concluding that one was better than the other. I don't know which, he says, which it was. But he might have an opinion about which it was. Um, so, um, but I don't know, I mean, your example is a little different. Well, yes, my example was a little bit different because I was trying to describe Pete's uh, attitude toward poker independently of any specific, specific situation. Uh -huh. And in that case, I was supposing that I could use both conditions as without contradicting myself. So, uh -huh. They are not inconsistent, actually. I 
I mean, two conditions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just, uh, it is related, just a minor clarification. Because uh, uh, sometimes you say, uh, it's a very interesting example, okay? Sometimes you say they are contrary conditions. Uh, in the first paragraph, you say they are inconsistent with each other. In fact, uh, they are not inconsistent with each other because they just imply, taken together, they imply that Pete did not call. They are not inconsistent. I mean, so maybe this is related to what, to what you are saying. You are not uh, contradicting yourself if you assert both. You are just implying that Pete did not call because the two, con the two statements, log uh -huh. logically speaking, they are not inconsistent. Uh, well, they uh, imply that Pitt did not call. This is my, my, my minor ask, uh, uh, uh -huh. question. I mean, it's... Uh, right. It's clear enough that the narrator can accept both conditionals in their context, however it's uh, explained, and, um, and judge that the antecedent is therefore false. But... Um, uh, and even with ordinary conditionals where the antecedent is impossible, the ordinary logic of conditionals allows both to be true. But mere falsity is not enough to make them both true. That's the material conditional. So the idea is it seems intuitively that we have a principle of, uh, of conditional non-contradiction. That is, within a fixed context, with a proposition that is possibly true in the relevant sense of epistemic or whatever sense of possibility, you can't assert them both. But you're trying to get an example where you can. Right? So uh, I want to try to understand what the example is. Yes. So. I was trying to give an example, probably not of a specific situation, but just a description of the attitude of Pete towards poker. Uh -huh. So uh, I can say that uh, uh, supposing that Pete knows the hand of the person he's playing with, uh, if he calls, he wins, because Pete is very good at poker, and if he knows the, uh, the hand of the person he's playing with, and obviously he knows his hand, uh, if he calls, he wins. Uh -huh. On the other side, I can say that uh, um, whenever Pete has a uh, hand worse than his, um, uh, the person he's playing with, uh, and he doesn't know, obviously, the hand of the person he's playing with, then if he calls, then he what? Then and if he doesn't know the hand of the person he's playing with, then in that case, if he calls, he loses. Uh -huh. uh, so I was thinking that I can use both uh, sentences to describe Pete's attitude in general, probably. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's probably different from the case when that you are considered in which there is a specific situation under consideration. Right, yeah, yeah. It's Good. So I want to say about that kind of case is you can generalize and say under condition X, if A then B is generally true, under condition Y, if A then not B is generally true, uh, or maybe always true, and, and, and if you like. Um, but those aren't conflicting conditionals. They say this, you're talking about a different situation. So. Um, but I think the idea, I mean, Pete himself, um, uh, in, a, in a particular situation, um, he either knows this or that, or he doesn't, he either has a good hand or a bad hand, or so on. And, and um, 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 there won't be a situation, I think, where in the particular situation he can assert both. The one with co conflicting uh, consequence. Right? Um, so again, when, as soon as you get around to generics and things, then then you get um, th then you get a different story. So it could be that uh, generally, if A then B, um, when generally is context dependent one way, and when it's context dependent another way, generally if A then not B is not that. And so you know you could. There, I have to look at a lot of examples to see exactly how all those things go. Can I ask something different, a very different question? Um, 
it is a question about the um, the projection strategy, uh -huh. and I'm a bit confused about this strategy. Uh, I'm, it's not clear to me how really you can hold this strategy and uh, accept that um, um, what, whatever we are saying has an objective truth value. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, my intuition goes and vanishes, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about what I'm saying. But in the case when you were describing Goodman, uh, when uh, you were saying, so there are certain pro in, in certain cases, there are certain properties which belongs to certain object which we observe and then we can uh, uh, project this property also into in ob an observable. Uh, it seems to me that in this case um, uh, we are maintaining a certain kind of, of objective uh, claims. Mm -hmm. But there are other cases in which you were trying to describe, for example, Hume, and uh, uh, according to he, uh, him, the projection is just a projection of our um, mental uh, associations. Uh -huh. So if we project our mental association, association how can we uh, be sure that our mental association are not just subjective and, mm -hmm. or, and, and, and not objective? Mm -hmm. or, or, or how can we be sure that they are objective and not subjective? That's mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah, now, um, my examples of the projection strategy, uh, again, which is a very impressionistic description of a certain kind of approach, were quite different in one way, and that is that Hume is the least explicit about, um, I mean, in some ways, it's, if you take the projection to be a, a simple confusion, as Hume did, then it's clear enough, enough what the confusion is in a, in a certain way. But to think of this as, in fact, a legitimate um, move of, of um, finding in the world something which plays the role um, uh, that causation plays and the epistemic role that it, it plays. Uh, it's then Hume's, um, again, that's imposing something on Hume and it's, mu it's, it's much more open-ended exactly what's going on in that, in that case. So I think the, one of the things one of the insights behind Goodman saying maybe, um, maybe dispositions are an easier problem is that the nature of the projection in that case as a, as a conceptual task is much clearer what, what you're doing. It's not, I mean, projection really is in this way um, 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 a commitment that goes beyond your evidence, as induction must, but also as conceptual. So the idea that there is such a property is, is a hypothesis. And, uh, um, that we have, in Goodman's terms, determined uh, an extension. So we say we have an extension that distinguishes things put under suitable pressure and uh, as being the ones that flex and the ones that don't, and that gives you an extensional distinction. It doesn't say anything about the things beyond that. Uh, and now we're saying, but we're going to extend that very distinction beyond that. Well, how? Right? And um, uh, that involves empirical hypothesis. And it's got to say there is a property uh, which explains why things flex. And 
That's my hypothesis. I haven't, you know, I'm just assuming that. And if there is, then we should be able to find it in the world. By, by finding it doesn't mean you know, opening the box and observing it, because we're not saying it's ever going to be an observable property. But we should be able to find connections between it and other properties, which we have other ways of, which are also theoretical but, or not observable, but we have ways of testing for them. And so um, you can think of the project as um, partly hypothesizing, which has certain consequences for what's, you know, the, the, the being, I mean, it's a very general assumption that real properties of things manifest themselves in many ways, including unknown ways. Right? And you can, so we have a project of trying to find the property. Uh, and that I take to be what, uh, and, and Goodman does say a little bit more about exactly how that should go. I mean, that you, you start looking for generalizations between um, further inductively supported generalizations between this new hypothesized property and other properties and applying your inductive rules to those. And in that way, gradually build up a theory uh, which justifies the claim that there is such a, a property. But it's right that, um, I mean, first of all, if you're wrong in your hypothesis, if your hypothesis is on the wrong track, there really isn't any such property as in the luck case, then um, the hypothesis that there's something objective will turn out to be false. And so there isn't anything objective. There, isn't, there, is a, there are beliefs that there is a property with certain features, but there isn't any property. And um, the very general question for a Humean if one thinks in terms of this projection strategy, is causal notions, uh, are they in the world? Uh, that's a very abstract uh, um, property to find in the world. But still, um, you know, one could say, no, there isn't. There's just regularity and nothing beyond that. Uh, that's, you know, and you say, and if, uh, I'm saying, well, uh, you can't, argue on a priori philosophical grounds that that's right, you've got to try on your projection and see how well it works. And if it works, uh, in the sense that you find further inductive generalizations which get supported, then, um, then you have a good reason to believe you're on the right track. Right? That's, that's the, again, it's a very, there's not a tight argument or a tight analysis here. There's just general strategy. <coughs> Sandro. Um, sorry, this is a question that is a bit eccentric to, with respect to your theme, but since you mentioned it, then sort of I exploit, the, I take advantage of it. Concerning the conditional, uh, the Alan Anderson conditional that you mentioned as an example of inference to a good explanation, uh -huh. if she had taken arsenic, she would be showing just the symptoms she is in fact showing, mm -hmm. which is counterfactual. You mentioned that the corresponding um, indicative conditional is trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you, you're in favor of a unified analysis of counterfactual and uh, indicative conditionals. Mm -hmm. Now, but this kind of uh, contrast between the indicative and the counterfactual conditional uh, that you mentioned is uh, uh, one type of evidence that Frank Jackson uses to argue that um, that indicative conditionals are not modalized; uh -huh. they are uh, um, just uh, just material conditionals, uh, because uh, so that the triviality would be explained if, or the indicative would be explained if uh -huh. uh, it were a material conditional. <laughs> because there is just one world and so uh, um, um, the symptom that uh, she is in fact showing, uh, there's no mm -hmm. comparison between a kind of factual world and uh, the real yeah, world. Yeah. Uh, so any thoughts on yes. that? Yes, so um, on the kind of account of indicative conditionals that I want to give, the actual assertion is very close to the assertion of 
uh, material conditional. So uh, the reasons for rejecting the material conditional analysis are um, um, have to be somewhat um, subtle here. But first of all, one can explain why the Anderson conditional is trivial in the indicative version uh, on the basis of, um, of the kind of account of modalized account of conditionals I want to give. So the modalization here has to do with your epistemic situation, not with, um, uh, not with some kind of circumstantial modality. So um, uh, it's, in a, in a way, a priori that she shows, she, she shows just the symptoms which she shows. It's not just true, but um, just by the way this sentence is constructed, it's true. And if you don't want to go so far as to say it's a priori, at least it's known. I mean, if you were to identify the symptoms, but we all know she showed symptoms X, Y, Z. If she, uh, if she has, um, if she took arsenic, she's showing symptoms X, Y, Z. You're taking it for granted that X, Y, Z are symptoms that we know she showed. So the context, the the contextual constraints on the modalized conditional in the indicative case force you to remain. Uh, with all the presuppositions that you're making. So one of the presuppositions uh, is that she shows the symptoms that she showed, uh, the particular ones. Uh, those are, that's, that's common ground between the speaker and the, and, and the addressee, and that's why um, it's trivial. Now, the more general defense of, uh, or the more general argument against material conditional analysis um, I think, um, I mean, part of the, the place where Dorothy Edgington and I are in total agreement is with the kinds of arguments she gives for that. So her argument for the non-truth conditional, non-truth functional, non-truth conditional view generally is, well, if it expresses a proposition at all, it's got to be the material conditional. But it doesn't, for the following reason. And for the, the reasons she give are all the reasons we have for dismissing the, the material conditional analysis. I mean, arguments that seem invalid, I mean, it seems it grounds for denying conditionals. Uh, you don't deny if A then B, because you, it's not required to deny if A then B, that you know that A is true and B is false. This is the argument she talks about for the existence of God, which says um, if we um, 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 how does it go if um, um, I can't remember but it's roughly the idea you, you, you say if God exists then um, um, if but, God doesn't exist, then if God doesn't it's not exist, the case that if I pray, then, uh, I, all my prayer pray. will be answered. I don't uh, pray, I therefore pray. God <laughs> exists, right? Yeah, right. So, yeah that's, that's <laughs> right. Good, thank you. Um, um, so you say, so the, the, the assertion conditions uh, are very close to the conditions for the assertion conditions of the material conditional with the added um, requirement that you don't, it, it, the context does not answer the question whether the antecedent is true or not. It's an open question. So that's the assertion conditions on the modalized account, uh, which explains why you never assert conditionals on the basis of the falsity of the antecedent. But if you just give us, and you need a pragmatic explanation for that. And of course, Frank Jackson has pragmatic explanations for that, as does David Lewis. So it's not that it settles the matter, but I think, um, you know, that's a, since I was agreeing with Dorothy Edgington about this, I didn't, spend time arguing that point, but it is a point that needs to be argued. I have another question concerning the Mississippi River boat. Um, you said that the example is designed to make trouble for the propositional view of conditionals. Uh -huh. um, but so it seems to me that one could um, comment on the story by saying 
Zach thinks that if Pete called, he won. That Zach thinks that if Pete called, he won. Right, yeah, yeah. It seems to me that that is true. Uh -huh. But um, the Edgington doesn't have a proposition as the object of belief. Uh -huh. So she would have to tell some story here um, to explain why embedding a conditional in um, a belief report uh, turns out good, to be good, yeah. uh, true. Yeah. Uh, so she would have to find a proposition um, related to the speech act, the conditional speech act that can act as, a, as an object of belief in this right, case, yeah. I assume. And right, right, yeah. And, okay, so, I mean, what could this proposition B, if she says uh, the proposition is uh, the, the sentence Zach thinks that if Pete called he won, should be reconstructed as Zach thinks that that speech act he performed uh -huh. is correct. I mean, that's sort but, of the most plausible uh -huh. I, I know. Yeah, Most yeah. plausible is a big word, but uh -huh. uh, seems to be one way to reconstruct it. But then, um, suppose that not only Zach, but Mac also said, if Pete called, he won. I want to say that they believe the same thing. Right. But according to this reconstruction that they gave of the object of belief, they don't. Uh -huh. Good. So. First of all, uh, um, I'm taking the main reason for wanting to go with a propositional account as connecting with cases where a propositional account works better. But the issues you raise are additional considerations, I agree, in support of a propositional account. That is, we naturally say these things are true. And we naturally uh, want to identify what different people say, even if they say it for different reasons. So uh, even if uh, um, one person says, if Pete called, he won for one reason, and another person says it for another reason, do we want to say they said, they said the same thing? And they either both were right or they both were wrong. But that further thing is, can be problematic because to the extent that we're forced to say, and we want to say anyway, that the, the indicative conditionals are highly context dependent, and depend very much on the particular epistemic situation involved, then change the context and you may be uh, one speaker versus the other, even if they say the same thing rather than contrasting things. Um, I mean, they utter the same sentence. Um, uh, the question whether they said the same thing, um, if they were in different contexts, is much less clear, I think. But I think the embedding issue you raise is a good one. We, we do want to say, um, um, just as a matter of how we talk, I mean, we want to say, uh, even with the most uh, epistemically local con uh, uh, indicative conditionals I want to say a person who asserts it believes it or uh, maybe even in some cases knows it uh, and uh, and also want to say it's easy to say it's true what he said is true um, so um, that's work to be done for somebody who has the gibbard kind of view. He's given me a lot of work to do in re reconciling uh, my view with, with the, these facts. But uh, there are also problems for uh, the anti-propositionalist in, the, in these cases. And, uh, and, I, and they came out, I think, in the linguistics development of not just conditionals, but epistemic modals, is um, the idea that we want a kind of expressivist account of epistemic modals, when you say might, it might be, the keys might be uh, in the garage, where we're looking for the keys, where, where could they be? They might be in the garage. Um, what is that saying? Is, is that an assertion of a claim? It's true that they might be in the garage? Turns out they're not. 
Uh, might they have been? Well, you know, you, some people are just simply expressing that we oughtn't to, we ought to leave that possibility open. We ought to check it out, something like that. But you're not saying, asserting anything. But compatible with that, one often wants to give a truth conditional analysis of expressive uh, language. And um, uh, so there is a question whether you can reconcile things that don't, strictly speaking, have truth values with a truth conditional in context um, theory of them is a interesting, interesting idea. But I, I, I think, uh, um, I think, kind of some of the facts you're pointing to give us reason to look for that at least. Well, uh, just another curiosity about the example of Sly Pete. Uh, uh -huh. uh, there seems to be a, a connection with uh, between uh, uh, particular. Uh, Zach's claim, or if you want, even Jack's claim, and uh, uh, McGee's uh, putative counterexample to modus ponens. Uh -huh. You know, you can probably reconstruct uh, this case in order to produce a McGee-style counterexample to modus ponens. Just uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. to ask whether uh, the connection has been noted by Gibbard or by, by someone else. Uh -huh. Good. No, that's a good point, and I think, in particular, um, very sp specifically, you can do that by saying, I mean, because Jack, or Zach, rather, let's say, could, could make, he doesn't know whether Pete has a winning hand or not, but he could say, if Pete has, uh, if Pete has a winning hand, uh, or rather, if Pete has a losing hand, then if he called, he lost. Um, even though he asserts that he called he won. Um, uh, and Pete does have a losing hand, so the antecedent of his nested condition is true. Um, but here he is asserting one that conflicts with the consequent. So, you know, that that's, that's fits, right, that's not what you have in mind. But, uh, right, and so um, the answer to the counterexamples to modus ponens generally are um, always answers that presuppose some kind of context dependence, and um, there are often problems with the particular way of doing it, but that's, that's what you have to say. And, and the thing is, that, the interesting thing is that one starts off by saying, well, we can give a fairly um, um, traditional view of the truth conditions which is what my kind of theory does, and, and a systematic theory of, of context, which helps explain uniformities in the context shifts. And other people come along and say, well, look, these uniformities ought to be built into the semantics. And if you build the uniformities into the semantics, then you, you may say there's a sense in which modus ponens is, strictly speaking, invalid. Right. And, and that's the kind of way when McGee and these other people do. And other, other dyna dynamic semantics and people who talk about some ought cases and so on, it, it's all, um, uh, it's, it's not that it's radically different in the story to be told about what's going on. It's more the theoretical mechanism you're using draws lines at slightly different places. I think. But it's good, good observation. I think. Okay. Last question by Tobias. Thanks. Yeah, so I have a question about the projection strategy, and I was a bit uh, confused in one of the earlier responses or questions. So maybe if you can just clarify. Um, so the way I took it, what you said was something like this. The projection strategy is that we have reasons to think that um, uh, projections like causation or something like that track real properties, things in reality. If the projections help make sense of the world, empirical data help us make accurate predictions or something like that. Uh -huh. Okay, so, but that seems compatible with the Humean picture. So, um, you have rigid patterns or regularities, then talk of causation tracks those in some interesting sense, but you can still be a, an anti-realist about, or not take the talk in a literal sense. You just think that, you know, you track the patterns or something like that, uh, without thinking that there is a property causation that fills in the gaps between facts or the, mm -hmm. the points of the pattern. 
So I read this as hum I read humans being a metaphysical anti-realist instrumentalist about causation. So my, my question is, does projectivism aim for uh, realism about the projected uh, notion, concept, thing picked out, or does it just aim to track patterns? And then mm -hmm. in what way does it con really contrast with the human picture? Good, good. Okay, so um, I'm sympathetic to uh, a very general um, strategy for answering that question, which is Quine's strategy. I mean, Quine said, look, uh, Carnap said we should be pragmatists about um, the frameworks we adopt. I'm saying, says Quine, we should be realists. Um, that is, and that's because the distinction between choosing an instrument, an instrumental, um, or giving an instrumental justification for one's theoretical commitments, uh, and giving a, um, a realist justification in the sense of saying we have epistemic reason to believe that the world is that way when a theory works well. So um, while in some ways Quine and Quine would say he's a pragmatist, he wants to say being a pragmatist, which seems to go with more being instrumental means of assessing one's theories. But um, there isn't really a difference between being an, uh, a pragmatist about one's theoretical commitments and being a realist about them. This goes with the idea that there is no um, ground level uh, a fact which we're definitely realists, we're, we're all realists about. And then a layer on top of that about which there can be question whether it should be a realist or, a, or an instrumentalist. And, uh, it's rather that we can't even form the most basic descriptions of the world with which we begin unless we have some theoretical resources. So the idea is that it's trying to be an instrumentalist, but also to make a divide between the things we're realists about, the ground level, and the, the stuff we're more, or, um, um, instrumentalist about, requires this division, uh, have some strong metaphysical motivation uh, behind it. And, and again, Quine would say, look, conceptually, it's ordinary physical thing talk we start with, and that's theoretically loaded. Going to phenomenal properties is stepping backwards to something more theoretical. Uh, and that's why when Quine emphasized the empiricist base, the base in experience of uh, evidence, he wanted to say, but we've got to describe experience in terms of theory, sensory stimulation and stuff. And all that presupposes a world in which there's things giving off rays and stimulating the eyes and all this kind of stuff. So he has a physicalist conception of fundamental experience, which means that's not the epistemic base uh, of our theory. So I think m my arguments, or at least claims, that, um, that we don't have a clear base, um, a supervenience base, of fact to distinguish from the natural necessity notions. Uh, uh, but rather, it's, it's, uh, those are involved all the way down, uh, goes with um, the Quinean idea that we don't have a clear distinction between instrumental and, and, uh, and realist. Does that help? OK. So I guess we can, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.